Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Rafael Murrieta. I am a researcher here on CIMAT. Uh, and this is the first of a series of talks about robotics for celebrating the opening of the master program in robotics at CIMAT Zacatecas. And our speaker today is Dr. Steven Laval. Uh, Dr. Laval is a professor of computer science at the University of Ulu. In Finland, from 2001 to 2018, he was a professor in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In research, he's very well known for his introduction of the rapid exploring London trees, the other trees, what is a widely used uh, algorithm in robotics and other engineering fields. And he's the author of three books, uh, Planning Algorithm, which is one of the books more cited on the field and other two books, Sensing and Filtering and Virtual Reality. Uh, his research interest includes robotics, uh, virtual reality, sensor fusion, planning algorithms, computational geometry, and control theory. And with regard to industry, he was an early founder and chief scientist of Oculus VR. And from 2016 to 2017, he was a vice president and chief scientist of virtual augmented and mixed reality at Huawei Technologies. Uh, well, uh, we are really glad to have Steve here today. Please help me to welcome Steve. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. All right. Please go ahead, uh, Steve, with your, with, your, with your talk. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very happy for the invitation and uh, very sad that I cannot be here in person. I, I don't think I've had a chance to run around in Zacatecas. I would, I would like that very much. So uh, maybe, maybe next time. But I wish you the best of luck with your new uh, um, division of, of um, oh, your new program of master's program in robotics and, and your new activities there. So it's very exciting. I have a very close connection with the CMOT for many years through Rafael and many of his other colleagues there. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, so title of my talk, Billiard-like Robots, Let Them Be Unstable and Unobservable. Um, I tried to make a kind of provocative title, so maybe to attract some control and dynamical systems folks. First of all, I want to mention this is some work that's been done over, um, over for over a decade. Um, many different researchers in my, in, my, in my group have contributed to this. The most recent is uh, Alexandra Nillis, who graduated last uh, fall and she's now a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University. There's also uh, Israel Becerra, who's, um, who was a, a student of uh, Dr. Murrieta, and he's currently a colleague of Dr. Murrieta at the, at the CIMAT in Guanajuato. And many others, you can see some Spanish-looking names in there. Uh, there's uh, three Colombian guys in there. You know which ones they are, probably. So anyway, so, um, so, <laughs> so we had many good collaborations over the years on this. So for, from perspective, I'm talking about mobile robotics today. Um, typically in mobile robotics, you design and develop some kind of stable vehicle system that you can control very nicely, maybe construct geometric maps of the robot's environments through SLAM. Then you plan collision-free paths, do motion planning kinds of things to get from point A to point B without hitting things. Then you need a sensing system that performs state estimation to estimate where the robot's at as you uh, move it around. And then you can deploy a feedback control law to use that, the state estimates in order to track the desired trajectories or collision-free paths. And then in a case of multiple robots, you have communication and coordination issues. Maybe you share maps with them and so forth. So that's, that's very common for roboticists. That's the kind of things we do. For, for some perspective, um, a little bit different towards minimalism in some sense is swarm robotics. In this case, you have a bunch of robots all out moving about, and they tend to sense and respond to each other or react to each other. And there are motion control commands that tend to work with respect to neighboring landmarks or sorry, neighboring robots. The robots themselves become like landmarks that are used to express control policy. So this is some old work of James McClurkin, for example, which he did at MIT and then Rice University um, about 10 or so years ago. Um, so I wanna show you a very kind of simple robot um, that I think does something interesting. So, um, this is, let's say, an exploration robot. Hopefully, you get enough frames per second to enjoy this. Um, I'm going to cheat like they used to do in the old days in robotics and make it go faster. Um, so this is, my, this is my nice exploring robot. 
it, it tries to hit every sort of place along the walls there. Um, and, and I want you to contemplate about what kind of intelligence might be inside of this or what kind of strategy. See, it even found that little pocket down on the corner there, um, down on the very bottom, the little sort of wedge. Um, so very good exploration robot. So how did we do that? Um, well, the properties it had, I didn't give it any map in advance. I can put it anywhere. Um, I don't have any uh, position estimation system, so I don't have these traditional components. So no system identification has even been performed. So it's some kind of dynamical system, but I'm not really sure which one. It would be very difficult to measure and assess that. No sensors, as I just said. So that's why there's no position estimation possible. No cameras or any other thing too. So not even outside of the robot. In fact, it doesn't even have a computer or any digital computations going on at all, or even analog computations, depending on what you think analog computation means. Um, it's just one motor that oscillates at about two Hertz. So it's just, um, it's just a ball like this, and there's just a, a motor inside. And when you turn on it, it goes, and that's all. It oscillates at about two Hertz and costs about $4. So, so, so that's all it was. It's not really kind of thinking in any kind of reasonable way, but yet it has very nice properties that we want to exploit. So I find that kind of thing fascinating. So let's go through a bit of theory here. Um, so most of my career, I was looking in robotics at obstacle avoidance and particularly the robot motion planning problem, go from one place to another without hitting things. Well, now let's think about bouncing off of the obstacles. And we don't have to physically hit them. We can just think of bouncing as like a kind of virtual operation. Maybe the robot just gets very close to an obstacle and then turns and goes in another direction. So in the interior of the environment, we want to move along a straight line or a geodesic. And then when we get to the boundary, as you see here, there's an incoming angle theta and an outgoing angle theta prime. And we'd like to, um, to figure out what information do we need to calculate theta prime from theta. Um, what in, it could be done purely mechanically, or it could be done in a number of interesting ways. So for example, I might make a, a, a bouncing rule that's like a mirror reflection in the upper left here. So it comes in and at some angle and then bounces back off again. And so <clears throat> theta prime is just pi minus theta, pi being 180 degrees here. Maybe I have a right angle bouncing rule. So maybe the robot comes in and then bounces away at 90 degrees, depending on which direction it's able to go. It can only go in one direction unless you came in perpendicularly, but let's assume in general position, you can go in some 90 degree bearing. Another way is to just always exit in a direction normal to the surface. So ignore what direction the robot came in at and theta prime is just gonna be pi over two. So it just comes in straight like that. And um, we'd like to think about what information do we need? We'll get back to this near the end of the talk. Um, we want a, a policy or plan just like a control law, which takes um, an information state, that's this I here, it's a set of information states based on any kind of sensing information you have and produces an action, which in this case is gonna be the exit angle. It's gonna produce some theta prime. <clears throat> um, what is the information state going to be? It could be just the number of times that the robot has bounced so far. Maybe an even number of bounces, it goes in one pattern and an odd number of bounces, it does something else. Or maybe it's an estimate of which way it's heading in global uh, coordinates, like a compass. Maybe it's a position estimate. So it could be any, any number of things, but um, um, the simplest case is it just does the same thing every time. And that's the dumbest. And, and in this talk, I tend to prefer the dumbest strategies because they, they tend to be very robust in some ways. I wanna think about dynamical systems here. I mentioned uh, things like stability in the, in the title of the talk even. And um, I wanna consider dynamical systems in an iter iterated map sense. So the idea is that we have this map F and it goes from, let's say, x, y, theta to some x prime, y prime, theta prime. And then trajectories are just iterated applications of this function. So we apply f once, and then we apply f again, and apply f again. We just keep doing it by composition. And every time we, we do one application of the function, we're going to assume that f is taking the system from the boundary to the boundary. And I don't talk about what happens in the middle. Um, this is a kind of clever way to avoid expressing the problem in terms of differential equations. So. If you're a dynamical systems person and you, you, you need differential equations to be happy, then you will not be happy with the rest of the talk because I'm going to cheat. But this is a very nice cheat and it's been done in, in pure mathematics for a long time, going back to classical Poincaré maps where Poincaré was studying the, the, the motions of uh, planets. And if you look at this blue disc here, 
um, you might want to think about where does the planet hit the disk every time it comes around? And does it generate some kind of pretty pattern of dots on the disk that's orthogonal, this kind of cross section? Or um, it, well, in this pretty pattern of dots, does it come back to the same place again that it, that it started at some point? Or does it just go around visiting different places forever until it makes some very complex sort of dense filling pattern, let's say? So these are the kind of questions that people have been interested in in astrophysics for quite a long time. Um, so in, in the context of these kind of iterated map dynamical systems, there's a, there's a notion of dynamical billiards. So imagine a, um, um, well, living in Finland, I like to say a hockey puck, but um, so imagine a, an ice hockey stadium and you hit a hockey puck and the hockey puck just keeps sliding forever. And, and then in this case, it's assumed that it does this mirror-like bounce. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So a lot of well-known mathematicians have studied this. And in many cases, there's an entire paper devoted to just the properties of that trajectory and, and establishing something called ergodicity, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, that's another billiard. So, so Bunimovic studied this one, but then this is like another entire work just studying the properties of that billiard space. So, um, so it's incredibly challenging problems. And um, they're mainly studied by people who are interested in Hamiltonian systems, as I've said. Hamiltonian systems have volume preserving or measure preserving flows of, of, of the system. And so this reflection law happens to preserve that. So it leads to a kind of strange boundary case, so to speak, of, of Hamiltonian systems. And so most of the mathematicians I've talked to are somewhat apologetic for even studying it. You know, it's like a, a kind of mathematical puzzle or torment of some kind in the world of, of Hamiltonian systems. But for robotics, I'm going to argue that this and more are actually very useful. Um, a little bit of definition of this. So if, if you've seen ergodic systems in a stochastic context, this might look a little bit interesting to you. It's a little more general than that. It's a kind of general measure theoretic way to look at it. So I have some, some set that'll be the state space, typically X here. And then I, I talk about measurability. So I need some sigma algebra and some way to measure or, or talk about the volume of sets, if you like. And then I have this measurable transformation that goes from X to X. And that's just like these iterated maps. And then what I want is a measurable transformation that is measure preserving in the sense that this F inverse of A is the pre-image applied to A. So I have some set A and I want the measure to stay the same. If I look at the set of states from where we came from, that's F inverse, and now look at this, the, the set of states A, and I want the measure of those to be the same. And um, a, a measurable set is called F invariant mod zero if the symmetric difference is equal to zero sorry, the measure of the symmetric difference is equal to zero. In other words, um, if I look at the, if I, if I overlap the two sets and I extract the, the intersection of them, the, the leftover parts are almost trivial. They're, they're just, they have to measure zero. There's not very much left. So that's what F invariant mod zero means. And a function is called ergodic. If anytime you get this F invariant mod zero property um, for, for a measurable set A, it either has to be the entire space doing it with regard to measure, or a set of measure zero. So either the entire space up to you know, measure. So, so, so it has to be the measure of the entire space. There could be ignoring some little pieces of measure zero or um, the set A itself has measure zero. So what that means is you can't find some interesting sort of region A where the system becomes trapped. So in other words, um, I have the set A here and it's some, some part of the space that's not the measure of the whole space and it's not some trivial measure zero set. And for these ergodic systems, if you start off somewhere in A, um, you'll always, the system will always uh, um, escape. That's the idea, it cannot be trapped. To give you a very simple example, the set A for this example is the four blue intervals and the state space is just S1, so it's just orientations. And so every time I apply the map, it's just like applying a rotation. So you can imagine a robot just rotating in place and that's the whole state space here. Well, there's two cases. So if theta is pi over two, it's, some, it's rationally related to pi. Then um, if you start inside of the blue, uh, interval anywhere, you'll stay inside of one of these blue intervals. You might go from place to place to place to place for pi over two. You'll go jumping around between the, the four pieces, but you'll stay in that set. The system will stay in that set. Um, if you pick pi equals three over two, something not related to pi rationally, then, um, then no matter where you start inside of the blue set of intervals, the state will escape. It'll start wandering its way out. So, um, so it turns out that the theta equals three halves is an ergodic transform and the, um, and the pi over two one is not, it gets stuck. So, so it really makes me think about robots because we want robots to not get stuck. 
and robots are getting stuck all the time. So it makes me think that these ergodic properties are probably useful. So a little bit about ergodic theory. So if I talk, if I take any any um, um, mu integrable function with respect to some measure, say function g, um, I'll pick a, a simple function in a bit. But I, I could calculate the time average of a bunch of samples. This would look just like something you might do for, say, Monte Carlo integration of an integral or something. So, um, but but imagine I start with some point x in the state space, and then I keep applying f iteratively, and I see where it goes. So it goes bing, 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 starts going all around in the space, and I want to look at all the points visited. And, and then um, I want to compare that to the space average, which is just inter the actual integral. So imagine trying to approximate an integral like in a Monte Carlo sense. Um, this um, nice theorem by Burkhoff says that if f is ergodic, then these time and space averages are the same almost everywhere. And if you pick the function being g of x is equal to one, a very trivial function, what it basically means is that the frequency of visits to a particular set is proportional to its measure. So, um, so you're getting very nice uniform kind of coverage, let's say, and you can expect these points to be visited over and over again. In this case, they would be talking about the boundary for these kind of billiard problems. Um, it turns out that um, for almost all polygons and almost all initial conditions, this billiard trajectory is ergodic, which is pretty incredible. Um, if you're thinking measure zero for almost all, it's a little bit weirder than that. It involves meager sets and things, which I'm not going to go into. Here's a little Python code I wrote that, um, that shows how it bounce, how it would bounce around in this ridiculous simple polygon. So it's a simple, complicated polygon. Oh yeah, maybe it's missing some pieces, but it'll eventually get there. This is all asymptotic stuff. So the, the coverage might not look uniform yet, but it will eventually do this kind of very nice uniform coverage of the of the boundary. The interior might not look like that, but, um, but that's good. So you can imagine having a, a vacuum cleaning robot. It might take a while, but it'll eventually vacuum everything this way, which is a ridiculous bouncing rule. So simple. Um, well, you know, these mathematicians, they study these problems about um, these measure preserving maps, these Hamiltonian systems, but I don't care as a roboticist whether it's Hamiltonian or not in the way that it bounces. I want to consider different bouncing rules. I want to know what kinds of bouncing rules are easy to implement. And um, I might not even want it to be er ergodic. Maybe that's overkill. Just basic reachability keeps roboticists happy. You know, as long as I can prove that the, that the task is being achieved, that's good enough. I don't need this strong ergodicity condition. So we have a lot more freedom in robotics to experiment with different bouncing rules than these poor mathematicians who are really concerned about Hamiltonian systems. Now, the mathematicians could study our nice robotics problems. That'd be a wonderful thing for the people at the CMOT to do, of course. But, um, but we have to, you have to kind of reel them in, right? Get them interested in these very fundamental basic questions. So I'd like to ask questions like which bouncing rules lead to stability or limit cycles? Which ones have kind of wild properties that go exploring all over the place? Because of the bouncing, instability is not a bad thing. Instability can lead to ergodicity or other kinds of nice mixing properties or exploration properties. So it's, it's not a bad thing. It's bad in basic linear control because you have an unstable system and the system goes off to infinity, but here it can't go off to infinity. It reflects back and gets bounced around. So I'd like to know what kind of things we can achieve. There's a exa simple example is the Bernoulli map if you define it on the unit interval. Um, but if, if you go um, um, x to two x mod one, it's ergodic almost everywhere, but not measure preserving. So, so one, one simple property shows up in some of this dynamical systems literature for these types of systems is topological transitivity. And, and that's a weaker property than ergodic, but that's useful for us. What it basically means is that for some set of interest, let's say C, uh, usually on the boundary, um, I just wanna make sure that every open set gets touched basically. So it gets contacted in, in, the, in the trajectory. So, so no open set is left behind, you know, I, I, there, there are no lonely open set. They all get visited. In fact, they'll get visited infinitely often with, a, with, a, with an infinite trajectory. So topological transitivity is weaker than ergodicity, but that's enough for us. I don't care if the distribution is completely uniform. Um, so we started looking at different properties of other bouncing rules. Like for example, if you just always leave um, the surface at the normal, this is still two dimensional, but if you always leave the surface at the normal, then you end up getting repellers in these kind of corners like this. So as long as the interior angle is less than pi over two, then um, the robot will escape. <clears throat> so I, I can't help thinking about dynamical system properties like uh, attractors and repulsion. And so that's the kind of thing that happens here. Um, this is another example where um, if the system starts off anywhere to the right of this green line segment, then it will be attracted into this well or basin 
to the right of the purple line segment and it will stay there forever. So, so the, 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 the reach, so this is like, um, if this were a black hole, then when you get, when, when the little spaceship following this rule of bouncing gets to the right of the green line segment, then it's caught in the pull of the black hole and it gets pulled inside here. And this basin of attraction is like the, you, you've crossed the event horizon and you can't get out. So the event horizon is the green line, I guess. And then the black hole interior is this, by analogy anyways, this is this part to the right. This is another one where um, I think if you, if you bounce very close to a normal bounce, just a, just a little bit off um, and, 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 or normal would count too, then um, the system will always end up in the bottom triangle, but I don't have a simulation of that. But that's just some example. You can take particular polygons and study them. If you do the right angle bouncing law, it turns out that's an attractor for corners. So, um, so again, you have these, these corners are, are these kind of narrow cones, let's say. Probably cones is a better way to say it, narrow cones. And um, when, when, when the robot comes in, if it does the 90 degree bounce rule, then it will work its way into the corners. So the, these corner vertices become attractors inside of these narrow cones. <clears throat> we started developing visibility tools. So we applied some kind of general ideas from the field of computational geometry to develop some visibility based approach that um, allows you to construct a finite representation that's exact. So it's not approximate, but, but it tells you um, everything you need to know about reachability and stability um, for these kinds of systems by, by basically saying what would happen when you go from this interval to that interval along the boundary. So anywhere inside of these intervals that we've demarcated here, then um, um, the system will, will go from one to the next. Well, actually, it, it, it could leave anywhere in one, uh, in, in, along some set of points in an interval, and then it will bounce to a collection of intervals, but then we can calculate what happens for those and then continue to propagate. So this is a tool that lets us calculate these, um, let's say forward projections or flows of the dynamical system that we would like to, to have in, in these polygons. Um, so this just kind of gives you a picture of that. So it shows all of these intervals. And then um, if, you, if you leave anywhere inside of zero, the zero one interval, then um, the system will flow to these other places here um, showing the different, based on the different angles of, of bouncing, it tells which um, intervals get hit. So it's, so it's calculating all this for you in a pre-computed data structure. Um, and this is just coming out in the International Journal of Robotics Research this year. So, so it's just now available, some newest work on this. Um, and we have other, other results in this. So we, we, um, we, we can handle cases where um, the bouncing rules are not very precise. So the robot comes in, but then when it leaves, it may be anywhere within an interval. And we can reason about uncertainty intervals with, these kind of with this kind of data structure that we've built. Um, we also have some conditions under which a fixed bouncing rule leads to a contraction mapping, which I know mathematicians love in dynamical systems. And contraction mappings have a natural property of reducing uncertainty for these kinds of problems. Um, and so, for example, for any convex polygon, we show that there exists a fixed bouncing rule that has a stable limit cycle, and we use a Banach contraction mapping for that. Um, so that's all for kind of some, some sort of, let's say, theoretical stuff surrounding these questions. We also did some experimental things, and maybe the two haven't quite met in the middle, but, um, but I want to go back to this, this like weasel ball kind of things and talk about what you can do in practice with this kind of mentality. So I like to think about having a, what's called what I call a wild system. And by wildness, I, I, I mean that topological transitivity that I just gave. So, um, so the idea is that if I just have a two-dimensional example here, then what I would mean is that every open interval along the boundary is going to be struck by this robot. It's a robot's a point. And in fact, it'll be struck infinitely often, but maybe you only needed to get struck once. I'm going to assume we're in a regime where prediction is very difficult. Uh, sensing is limited or unavailable. And even the dynamical system modeling is, is difficult or system identification is, is difficult. So I cannot, in fact, for this spherical robot that is sliding and rolling in some complicated ways with a band of rubber around it typically, it's very hard to predict what's gonna happen, but yet it has very nice behavior. So, so system ID is very hard. And um, I, want, I want though the, the, the behavior of the system to be wild in some sense, untamed. And um, why might this be useful? Well, maybe in some micro or nano robotics applications, maybe swarms, maybe security, maybe you'd like your robots to be out, you know, threatening people who are exploring your building at night and aren't supposed to be there. So maybe they're just supposed to be out moving so much that, you know, you're, it's like, um, 
it's like in a movie where, where you always see like the, the bad guys trying to steal the, the jewels at the museum and trying to go around the lasers or something like that. But imagine these robots are just wildly running all over the place. Um, you're going to have a very hard time avoiding them. You can't really make an easy plan. Um, you can add a little bit of randomness if you want to help too, but then the bad guys might know the random C gener that generates the, um, well, let's say they'll know the pseudo-random number generator algorithm and the seeds. And, yeah, it goes on and on like that, but, but, but you get the idea. I'm not going to take the applications too seriously here. Um, but the, the first idea I had was I started thinking about how humans are controlled. So if you have a wild robot, why not think about how wild humans are controlled? And I was, I was sitting at this breakfast place in the United States once. Um, you get a free breakfast in the morning, but if you're, if you're there past 9 a.m., then, then the doors close. So I noticed that the patron of the restaurant walked up and closed the door so that nobody else could get in. But I could go out because it's a kind of one-way door. And I thought that was very interesting. And I thought, wait, why don't we control robots like that? We let them go one way, or, um, but maybe they, 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 they then cannot come, come back, right? Uh, same thing for letting dogs out the door. So um, like Raphael's barking dog, I don't know if he has one or not, but maybe the dog wants to go outside, the dog could go outside. And then you know, coming back in, well, if they, they have to make a request. Um, you see these turnstiles for, um, for herding humans around stadiums and things. There's a lot of related research to this herding kinds of things or funneling has gone on. Non-prehensile manipulation is a nice word. Non-prehensile means you're not sort of grasping, right? You're not like, this is prehensile manipulation. If I were to just kind of knock this cup around, it would be non-prehensile. So, so, so I've been influenced by a lot of those kinds of robotics works as well. Um, and also, I, I kind of want to beat this Maxwell's demon problem. So um, this, this is well known from thermodynamics. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that differences in temperature, pressure, and, and chemical potential will equilibrate. So if you put a bunch of particles, say, in two chambers, and say in chamber A and B, you have a, a mixture of hot ones and cold ones, what you should not be able to do is just have a little magic door made out of some material, some porous material that lets the hot molecules go one way, gas particles in this case, and the, um, and, and, and the cold particles stay on the other side. There'd be no way to do that without infusing uh, or expending some extra energy to control the gate. Um, there's ways to balance out the second law of thermodynamics to account for some kind of gate that's doing operations like this at some quantum level using quantum feedback control. There's this thing called the generalized Yazhinsky inequality, which, which, which applies to this to help kind of rebalance the, the law. There's nothing wrong with the law of thermodynamics, but, but the interesting thing is that you have to expend energy to know when to open the gate somehow. So there's some like information cost, which is, which is amusing. So, so we're gonna beat Maxwell's demon in some sense, but that's because we're doing things on the scale of robots. And we all know robots and sensors consume energy, so it's no problem. So the idea is gonna be to divide the environment of the robot into regions and gates. And that's just a bipartite graph. So there's gonna be a set of nodes called regions and a set of nodes called gates. And gates connect regions together, two or, two or more regions together. And that, that's really all you need. So we're gonna start figuring out how to transition robots from region to region. Um, and the, the idea is to design some wild bodies and put them in regions. And then we wanna control the gates like turnstiles or these little doggy doors to manipulate the robots into doing what we want. So between a pair of adjacent regions, I want to go from one place to another. Maybe I allow bi-directional passage. Maybe I say one way only, left to right or right to left. Or maybe I close them, I say no more passage, that's fine. So at any time I can do that. That's the actuation I have for these kinds of systems. I'm gonna let the individual robots or particles just go wild because I want them to. And then I wanna to try to use the environment to kind of herd them into doing things. Again, much like humans are controlled at a, at a stadium, let's say, sometimes not too successfully, but um, there's gonna be uh, four kinds of gates I'm gonna talk about. Static, they never change. Pliant which means they can change, but that's, they do it by force of the bodies themselves, like a turnstile, like the turnstile kind of can change in some way. Um, there's controllable gates, which is um, um, we, we apply some power to it and we can have information feedback then that, that, that determines what the state of the gate should be. And then this whole idea of a gate can be virtualized, which is, which is very interesting, I think. And then that'll be the, the end and I can take questions. Um, so how do you make a static gate? Well, you can just use some pieces of paper and a brick, and it looks very close to, to what we did for a dog here. Um, and then um, what we do is we say, okay, I want to have some set of regions. I want to do some basic calculations, just graph algorithms to compute a flow. So I want um, 
say we start, say the body starts in region one and you want it to get to region five, you just make sure that gate two allows flowing from one to four, gate one allows flowing from one to two, and so forth. You can see this stuff. So that's all you want to do. It's just a simple um, you know, graph search algorithm for, for computing this flow. And um, there's all kinds of work in robotics, which often is called sequential composition of funnels. And you can do very easy sort of things here. So, so for example, um, we have these, we have these, um, what I have there, five, six, six robots there. Now they're moving so fast. And we want them all to flow from this bottom right to this upper right region. And I will cheat again and make it go really fast. I'm just saying it happens. Okay, you might say, what about optimal? Okay, if you want to pay the price of optimal, doing optimal planning or optimal controls of robots, then it, then, then um, you lose a lot of properties. I'm trying to be a bit absurdist here, but, but, uh, but anyway, they eventually all work their way there. Is that robotics? Some of my colleagues may say that's not even robotics anymore. I, I don't know, but, uh, but I think it's worth thinking about. Oh gosh, people are, people are speaking American English really fast though. That's okay. I don't know what they're saying. Um, come on, finish. Hey, there we go. Woo okay, so you start to cheer for them. Um, all right. So that's the idea. And you can do the same thing with these vibrating bugs that were popular a few years back. Um, I remember even buying these at the OXO gas station when I was, when I was in Mexico last time I was along, well, several times ago when I was there. You know, so you can get them to vibrate their way from the red region to the white region. Um, what I'm not showing you here is that um, there's little like ledges and they fall down. It's very thin. So they're, they're on these little platforms. So the red one is the highest. So it's like falling down steps. So and eventually they all end up in the right place. Give the idea. Okay. So, um, so, so why not? So this one, these are static gates. I've engineered the environment to make it work like that. And um, yeah, you can make them do patrolling routes. So they just, they, they just keep going on forever, doing it on their patrol, um, going from region to region to region in a cyclic sequence. I can have multiple bodies patrolling, all of these silly static gates. Now I can make pliant gates where the gate has an internal configuration or mode. So for example, this is an L-shaped gate here. Um, kind of a, maybe it looks like a backward L in one configuration, then kind of a normal L in the other. So it just rotates like this. So when the ball comes through, it al the ball's allowed to come through, but then the next ball can't until another ball comes back and resets the gate. So, so that allows some very careful kind of manipulation. So if you wanted to keep the number of balls per region roughly constant, this is your gate. So, so it has this kind of control. So that's a pliant one. Um, I don't have the video of that one anymore, I think, but, but it, that's what it does. Um, this is a weird like four-way thing. It does some kind of like rotating 90 degrees like this, but same, same kind of ideas just uh, allows some sort of complex behavior by this kind of fixed revolving door. Um, then we started making controllable gates. So we put actuators on them and we can do the same four different options. And we can think about what information is used. So maybe we have the gates oriented one way for a particular time, maybe the first 30 seconds. And then when, when a counter is reached, we, we, we flip the mode to something else. Maybe we have simple sensor feedback, like a laser that detects a laser beam and emitter detector pair, let's say, that detects whether or not the, the robot has gone by. More generally, we can put any kind of filter there. Um, so we used a, a, a kind of tilting ramp for these balls. And then uh, if the ramp's tilted one way, the ball gets blocked. If it's tilted the other way, it, it can go over the ramp and fall. Um, so, so that kind of thing worked. I think I have some picture of that later, or maybe some more pictures. Oh, there's a, there's a laser here you can see. Um, so that it, you can detect whether or not the ball has gone and then change the, the mode if you like. Um, we also thought about what kinds of tasks can we solve. So not only can we get from point A to point B or do some basic patrolling, but uh, some people in control have found different kinds of logic specifications useful. So this is one called linear temporal logic. And so we did some work a few years back where we showed that you can specify um, any, um, um, any problem that can be specified using linear temporal logic we can translate into a solution and show that it executes very nicely using these wild bodies and very uh, simple gates that, that, that do this, this very, very uh, simple mechanism, very simple mechanisms, or you call it um, very simple actuation. Um, so, 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 so that's not too bad. You just have to find a region sequence that satisfies these LTL formulas. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but 
but just saying there's some logics to express much more complex kind of behavior. Like eventually you need to go to this place, but before that you can go here or here, but avoid these places. You can do all these kind of complex descriptions in, in linear temporal logic. Um, we started thinking then about controlling the distributions of bodies. Like we'd like to have more bodies in this region and less bodies in that region. And how can we do that? And um, um, there's a number of different ways to implement that. So we did a lot of simulation studies in that case because it got kind of difficult to make too many of these bodies. Nevertheless, we did one in, in reality. This one has about 50 bodies. Um, this was a shared lab with some computer vision researchers. They, didn't li they did not like us very much because um, um, these things are very noisy. So um, I'm trying to remember the distribution. I guess it was on the slide that I just iconified here. Um, four, one, two, one, four, two. Well, anyway, there's some specific distribution of ball densities that we tried to target. And then we have these fixed ramps and they flow, like this one has equal flow going left to right and right to left, the purple and black there. This one up here, it's also equal, but this one here has a purple going one way, but the black one going sort of down is um, allows more. So we can control the flow just by that. We did some analysis, some Markov analysis that shows that the, um, that the width of these intervals that we put the gates should correspond directly to, um, the, it should allow, allow us to calculate the densities that we want. And so this sort of thing where this needs to go much faster. And I'll, I'll skip a bunch, but anyway, at the end, it ends up with some targeted density that we like, which um, is probably hard to see, but, but um, oh my God, I don't know what happened now. I think I made a mess by jumping ahead while my player was, oh gosh, okay, let's restart it. Oh, okay, now it's recovered. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> it just does some kind of controlled density kind of thing. I can imagine implementing this on some kind of nano scale level. That would be really interesting, but um, um, but I don't know how to do it physically. I don't do research on that, but I've always tried to entice researchers who work in nano robotics to try to do something like this. I think it's, I think it's quite implementable. You know. All right. Um, then we had this idea of virtual gates. So we just took a very simple mobile robot. This is an open design platform called a CERB robot, open mechanical design that we um, added a bumper to and just put an old Arduino on it. And um, it has a simple, like, let's say one pixel camera pointing down that can detect the color um, um, of the floor at the place where it's rolling. And so we can make a virtual gate by, by, by saying that when the robot comes up to, let's say, a piece of tape on the floor, if it's white, it may do one behavior. And if it's red, it can do another behavior. So those can become gates then. We can say, okay, if red, bounce. If white, go through it. Then you can change the behavior. So, so we can do a simulation of a physical gate system, but it's still a physical robotic system in the end. Um, let's see, you think, oh, that one works? No, okay, this one. Yeah, this one does it. So, so these two robots are supposed to patrol back and forth. They both have the same code. They just, they'll, they'll, they'll go, they're first allowed to go through white, then allow to go through red, then allowed to go through white and then go through red. So the second one got stuck behind because it needs to go through white next and it messed it up because it's just bouncing, doing crazy stuff like it's supposed to. Um, it's not a race, so the red one's doing much better, but eventually this clueless blue one crosses the white, it's allowed to, and then it's able to keep going. So they're both patrolling back and forth, bumping into each other once in a while, nobody cares, um, doing kind of virtual bouncing. But, um, but these red, white, red, white patterns, they just need to be put on the floor and then they'll do these same kinds of behaviors. Um, but inside of each region, they're doing these uh, bouncing rules, like we said. And, and in terms of like a, a strategy for the robot, it's very simple, very simple information feedback. So if the sensor tells you you crossed white, you change to the next information state. If the sensor tells you you crossed red, you change to the next information state. So, so all you have is the information state in the robot's brain is just the last time I crossed a red or the last time I crossed a white. That's all it remembers. And, it, and it's able to, to do, do this kind of patrolling that we laid out for it. And you can imagine much more complex strategies are possible. Just slightly more complex than this will lead to very interesting behaviors. Um, we thought about using something we call a combinatorial filter to, um, to, to, to do this, um, um, to use as information feedback. And here's a very simple problem. So I have two bodies that can move around in this annulus shaped environment. There are three sensor beams, A, B, and C which will also serve as gates for this talk. And um, the, so the sensor readings then 
are just a sequence of letters, which are just, you can imagine A, B, and C are different colors, if you want to, we can call them letters. And, and what I want to do is I have a, a very simple filter that just keeps track of whether or not these two bodies are in the same room. And by room, I mean this upper part, this lower left part, or this lower right part. And so we designed a very simple filter. This was done with uh, a mathematician, uh, Fred Cohen, and uh, my former PhD student, Benjamin Tular, who actually was a former student a long time ago, uh, of uh, Rafael Murrieta, so, um, but uh, he did a PhD in my group, uh, currently works in the US. And um, um, we made this very simple filter where um, there's just four information states. T means they're together in the same room, and um, D means they're in different rooms, but A is the boundary between them. DC means they're in different rooms, but C is the boundary between them, and DB means they're in different rooms, but B is, is the boundary or separating them. Let's say, and this very simple filter, like if they're together and you receive A, then that means they're no longer together. One of them has crossed A. And so, they, so then the transition moves up to this DA. And if, if you get A again, that means they're both together again. Now, maybe they move to a different room. It could be one crossed and then the other one crossed, or maybe one crossed and then came back. I don't care because this doesn't matter. All that this filter take, keeps track of is whether or not they're together in the same room. Or you wanna keep them separated. Um, so we made a, a simple impl implementation of this and just made this very simple information feedback then. So these robots um, cannot be in the same room together, but we also require them to do patrolling in a clockwise order. So they, they do their own stupid things, but, but they cannot be in the same room together by this simple information feedback. I hear some really fast voice in the background of this. Now I wonder if the original video was sped up a little bit, but I, nobody cares. We could make this go really fast if that was our goal. You know, So how embarrassing. Somebody can publish a paper and do it faster. I don't care. But, um, but you, get, you get the idea. The behavior is the important thing here. So they, they're, they're always patrolling, but they have to keep away. They hate each other, though, so they have to keep away from each other. So, so that, that's the idea. So again, very, very simple um, filtering, very simple control laws. Uh, very simple computations, implementation, everything's really ridiculously simple here. All right. Um, yeah. Um, we, we, I'm getting near the end of my talk here. So we tried doing the same thing with, with uh, swimming. So we went to a fountain on, at the University of Illinois. We, we started gluing fins on these weasel balls. We don't know anything about aquatics, really. But um, so we did some sort of laughable attempts. I don't have a video of this, unfortunately, but, but the, 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 the balls were, you know, swimming around and bouncing off the edge of the, the, the reservoir. So, um, so maybe um, we, we, we try controlling crickets. So using live uh, insects, um, that was a lot of fun. Um, a bunch of the crickets started like moving in the direction that we wanted. We had them start in this region here and they started, they went over this ramp and then landed in this basin until the last cricket came along. And then it stood at the top and it seemed to be looking down at its friends. It was really strange. And then it started walking along the boundary here and decided to refuse to cooperate. So already I think crickets are outsmarting us. Um, it did finally decide to join its friends. I don't know why, but, but um, it was very strange. So I learned very quickly that uh, uh, dealing with nature is not the same. Um, that's fine. Let me, let me finish up here a bit and then I can take some questions. So, um, there's a general paradigm here, which I think is a beautiful theory of bouncing, which is, um, I think has a lot of interesting mathematics, a lot of interesting algorithms, a lot of interesting robot design. Um, and it has um, nice connections to ergodicity, reachability, stability, information spaces, dynamical systems, and so forth, topology. There's a lot of interesting things one can do here. Um, and, and the idea is to let the robots behave wildly in a regime where you have minimal sensing, communication, computation, and control capabilities. So. So you want to make the environment and robot design together in a way to manipulate them to doing work for you, but, but, but they're going to let them behave in a wild kind of manner. And then um, the, the idea, well, I just said it, to, 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 to make small environment modifications that, that let you gently control the robots. So we have many more challenges. There's more mathematical analysis of bouncing rule dynamics to be done. Um, we need to figure out um, task solvability. 
and how it ref and how it relates to different bouncing rules and environment combinations. There's a lot more things to explore there. There's a lot of room for improvement in these algorithms, these computational geometry style algorithms and visibility type algorithms for characterizing the dynamical system properties in polygons and in other kinds of environments. Um, we could design more physical systems and gate systems. So a lot of more experimental things to do, especially on a small scale, I think would be interesting. And uh, there's stochastic problem variations for all of this, but I thought it was interesting that we could stay away from probabilities and still get all of this interesting, rich uh, behavior. So probabilities just add more complications. You can do it, but you don't have to. And I, and I think that's, that's really quite, quite interesting. Um, I gave a keynote at, at IROS 2020 last fall called Rapidly Exploring Random Topics. So if you wanted to hear more about our work on rapidly exploring random trees or virtual reality, or what I think about industry versus academia, um, I even give some heartfelt words from, uh, from a Finnish sauna. So, um, so that's me in the sauna telling you about life. So, so feel free to look that up. You can find it easily with a Google search. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Thanks very thanks much. Thanks a lot, Steve. Go ahead, Rafa. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, we will have, we will take questions now. Don't be shy, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so everyone can either raise their hand. There's a reaction button on the, on the bottom. And you can also write them down if you prefer either. In yeah, if you, type, the... if you type into the chat, I can read it here. I, I have it on my screen, so there's no problem. Okay. Yeah, if, you are, if people are English, I, they can try. I'll give. You got the question, Diego. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, hello everybody. Uh, hello, Steven. This is Diego Mercado from CIMAT Zacatecas. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. And yes, I have a question. This is very interesting, these uh, very simple robots. And I was thinking, what about like uh, in a disaster situation, like a search and rescue mi uh, mission, what, what do you think about putting uh, very simple sensors, maybe inertial sensors? to do some sort of mapping and try to find something, maybe a heat source or, I don't know, some some chemical to try to detect a, a person or something. And then you have like redundancy, you know, because you, you can put like tons of these things just to explore randomly. And then, I don't know, some, somehow we'll get the information to the, to the source. What do you think, will this be feasible? Um, yeah, it, it might start to deviate a little bit from what I've talked about today, perhaps. Like, I wouldn't say that things apply directly, but but it's close. I, I guess I would start to wonder, first of all, what is its method of locomotion and how does that relate to the environment that you're interested in, right? Is it likely that these guys will get stuck in the mud or, or you know, in the sand or, you know, whatever the environment is, you have to deal with the heat or water or whatever. So, 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 so you could kill all of your robots with the same problem if you're not careful, right? So, so, so I'd say, one, you need some kind of robust ambulatory, you know, ways of making it move, uh, locomotion or ambulation or whatever you want to say. So, so, so you, have to, um, you have to somehow take care of that. The other problem is that um, you might want to make it move towards a su suspected source, like a heat source, if you like, as your idea works on. You can do some sensor feedback on that, but that's a greedy policy. And then greedy policies might get stuck in local minima. So maybe they all get stuck going to the same source and they kind of missed a weaker source that is the actual thing you're trying to search for. So so some amount of um, you know random exploration, these kind of wild behaviors would be would be useful. So you, you could consider a whole line of research actually, based on what I talked to today. That's like a kind of a mixing, a blending of um, a greedy behavior with the kind of wild running around. Kind of reminds me of the old uh, motion planner of Barak and Latom from uh, the late 1980s or something. If you know robot motion planning literature, but you can kind of mix between these two. If you find yourself stuck, do some random kind of walking around. <coughs> I hope that's uh, helpful. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Another question, comment. You know, I, I, I was wondering, it, it, I, it's, it seems to me that here, you are not controlling anymore the robots, but the environment. I, 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 I wonder if that may be an application, it may be to design buildings in order to control 
the behavior of people, for instance? Do you think that is, that is feasible? Um, I think that's been done since the beginning of time. Okay. <laughs> and you have to ask yourself, what were they thinking when they designed the, the, the CMAT in Guanajuato? How do they want to control you? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe a bad joke. The place is complicated, right? <laughs> they want you to yeah. exercise too. Yeah, but yeah, you, you could, you could, you could design a. For example, suppose you, know, you have a, you want to build a castle. Wouldn't you want to design it so that it's as hard as possible to get to the king? Okay, right? like like as confusing and difficult as possible. So, um, not only do you put a moat around the castle with with uh, dragons and whatever else, but but you know there's the structure would be very complex as well. I, I would assume that, you know, you know, high security facilities are designed in a way that make it really complicated to just uh, walk your way into. Um, apparently, the U.S. Capitol building is not because it was very easy for people to just walk right in and do crazy stuff in January in the United States. So I was surprised by that. But maybe because it was designed a long time ago and more with a regard for beautiful architecture and not high security. But, um But that's an interesting idea. And you can also design buildings to make it easier or harder for robots to operate as well, right? Yeah, exactly. You got a question in the chat? Yes. Yeah, so, um, also, 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 Israel has a question first, I think. There. And then there's a yeah. question also. Yeah. Okay. How are you, Steve? Hey, good, good to see you. see you. Yeah. Hope we can visit you soon. That would be nice. Then. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I got a question. Um, Regarding this kind of robots, there's something that you are gaining that is that the, the robots are essentially really simple, right? But on the other hand, it also looks like you are uh, compromising some other properties, like the, the the last slides that you were showing were you were saying, well, maybe you can do this faster, but in this case, we didn't care about it, right? So the question is, is there like a relation of, of or just imagine an, an abstract space that you can design where you have in different axes uh, what you are gaining, maybe in simplicity, but what you are losing in other properties, maybe optimality or time optimality or, or something like that, like these compromises that you may be uh, gaining and also losing or something like that have you something about that regard yeah thanks no, i think it's a, it's a very nice question I, i just um i don't have anything that can be sort of mathematically put down on paper and analyzed because i think it's very hard to do proofs of these things or even to talk about a metric space of uh robustness or something right like like, like the systems may be very robust in its behavior even though i don't have system identification for it right i just talk about the properties that i wanted to experimentally exhibit so there's a lot of cases where we're You know, it's, it's more based on intuition and trying to get trying to maybe get people to observe the high price you pay for certain requests. You may pay a high price for optimality. You may pay a high price for um, for wanting perfect uh, state feedback mm -hmm. and, and all these sort of things that you demand. And, and you, if you might realize that your problem did not actually demand all of those things. You just thought you needed them as some components along the way. And so, so it's more to kind of provoke some thought, but it would be beautiful if we could make it kind of, you know, map out the space of possibilities here and, and um, mm -hmm. um, make it make it you know really nice you know embed it all in r7 or something you know, make, make it look really nice that, that would be cool um, and then the burden would be on some sort of to do mathematical analysis of, of sorts um, I don't know how to do that really but, but I'm mostly operating by intuition or, or the idea that you can just manipulate just change the environment a tiny bit and make life so much easier for the robots right that, that that's Um, you know, one could say that for autonomous driving, right? You just change the autonomous driving environment, the, the, the roads just a little bit, and it could be much, much easier for cars to drive themselves. Um, but, but people aren't willing to do that. They, 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 they wasted so much effort in building these roads. They're not going to build new ones for the autonomous cars. Okay. So, so it's, 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 it's interesting. It's related in that sense. Well, thank you, Steve. And good to see you. Yeah, thanks. Good seeing you. Um, I'm going to read the, the question. I think it was an inspirational talk about robotics, the exploration approach. It's really interesting overall in, in changing and channeling environments. My question is if you put a sensor and a repulsion policy in several balls, do you think the balls will create a geometric structure? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think um, my student, Ali Nillis, was very interested in that. Um, she wanted to get it so that the, 
balls or could come together and maybe form structures. And even we put some extra parts in the environment to see if they could kind of come together. Or maybe they start off attached geometrically, like in a triangle, and then you try to get them to um, do some manipulation or guidance in some way. Um, but um, um, I think it's possible. I have the intuition that that's an interesting direction. But uh, we never did enough work on it. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Of course, once you start having the balls interact with each other, then you have to maybe get rid of external obstacles and other things like that. Maybe you just want to watch how they all move together then somehow, or put them in a very simple like disc environment or rectangular square environment and, and forget about interior obstacles and things. I would keep that part simple if you want to explore that. Thanks very much. I think I'm, I'm gonna jump at you and see if there's anybody else. But I, I found really interesting the comparison to humans, which we seem to make these blocking mostly for economic reasons, the one-way gate. But the insect example was very nice, and I was wondering if you, if you have thought of any other insect that would have like a more interesting behavior or that does it naturally. I don't know if like bees in beehives or they have some structural behavior. I, yeah, I haven't really. I mean, this was like a quest for making the stupidest robots possible and then have them do something surprisingly interesting, right? And, and I, but then already, you know, ants, ants are really, or amigas, right? Are, 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 are very interesting creatures, right? I mean, they, 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 they build all kinds of complex structures and, and, and do all kinds of interesting behaviors. People motivate swarm robots based on ants and thing and, and, and maybe some other insects as well. But um, so I, I don't, I don't really have enough of a, a sense of, um, of kind of what insects might behave exactly like the kinds of things I'm showing. In the case of ants, they're, they're known to use a stigmergy, like, like they, they can place a scent in some location and then they all kind of communicate in some way, complicated way. Um, well, maybe some simple way, really. And, and they're able to have very complex behaviors emerge from that. So there's all kinds of surprising things going on, even with very simple insects. Um, maybe you can try. I forgot there's this one special worm. It's like the simplest neural structure out of any living creatures. I think it has like 304 neurons. I think it's called a round worm or some kind of worm. I don't remember the exact name, but um, like, like could be, <laughs> it could be worth seeing if you can fool them but, um, or, or what, what kind of things you can do before they just kind of outsmart you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very, it's very tricky to play with insects. I'm, I'm not very good at playing God in that sense. So you know, better to stick to robotics. <laughs> we probably shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Last chance for any questions, I guess. I don't know if Rafa, you have any final remarks and we can speak nicely within an hour. Well, I, I, I just want to, in, to invite the public, all the people to the next talk tomorrow at 9 a.m. Dr. Stephen Brewster from University of Glasgow. He will talk about uh, ultrasounds, optics, and levitation, the future of human computer interaction. So remember tomorrow at 9 a.m. And finally, I want to uh, remember all the public that we are opening a master program. If you know students that might be interested, please let them know that we have this new program. Eh, let me switch to Spanish. Los invitamos este, a todos al, al, a la apertura de la maestría. Este, si conocen estudiantes interesados, por favor avísenles. Este, esperamos espera, eh, empezar este agosto. Y este, la límite de recepción de solicitudes es el 22 de junio, si no mal recuerdo. Este, thank you very much, Steve. It was a great talk. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wish I could visit Thanks. you all in person. Um, Thanks. I could go for a nice Mexican meal now. That would be really good. You know, get some yes. or something. You, oh, you well. need to, uh, <laughs> to come back. Yeah, exactly. But still a uh, work in progress. We hope to, to finish it. Yes, Thank you. Exactly.